Hello, everyone, and welcome to our live fireside chat today. I'm super excited to welcome you to the show. This uh, evening, we have a wonderful guest joining us from none other than Google. I would love to introduce A.B. Atawudi joining us live from Amsterdam today. Hello. How's I it love going, Avi? Live from San Francisco, but we're both in uh, <laughs> in Europe. We're both in Europe. Really That's fantastic. <laughs> Off to, a, off to a great start here. Um, so yes, exactly as Avi said, we're both joining you from Europe. I'm in Paris and she is in Amsterdam. Uh, I am, my name is Chantel. I am a product marketing manager here at Product School and I'd love to turn it over to Avi to introduce herself as well. Hi, my name is Avi Atarodi. I am a director of product at Google, um, supporting the team that looks after the YouTube studio product. So if you're a creator, you probably um, have used that product. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for joining us again, Abby. We're super, super grateful to have you here this evening. We've got a lot of awesome questions in store for our audiences who are tuning in around the globe uh, this evening, this afternoon, this morning, wherever you might be. So I'd love to deep dive in and get started with the first one, which is super general. Uh, but can you tell us a little bit about how you got started in product mark management? Absolutely. Um, the interesting thing about this story is that, it, you know, there's a really popular saying that hindsight is twenty twenty. So looking back, it all fits together. But looking forward, I had no idea what I was trying to do. Um, so I have this trifecta of a career, which is you. some people call it the three stools or the triangle. And we talk about in product management, engineering, understanding the business and the user experience. And essentially that's how my career went. So I started as an engineer, I was in hardware, then moved over to full stack, um, very early days. And then I moved into design. I was very excited about how you sort of take this, these concepts are sometimes ethereal, they feel a little bit ethereal. And design is the first time that it's brought to life, right? In a way, it's the first time it's a little bit more tangible. So pivoted into design um, in parallel, that's a whole other story, published a book on photography, which was meant to be a very short product, but scope creep, every product manager knows about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then uh, moved into operations and that's kind of where the product uh, management transition happened. I was a general manager at um, Uber for West Africa and we did all this work in your product marketing. So you can probably appreciate, you know, we did all this work, marketing the product, getting it in front of people. And then they would come in and they would drop off because they couldn't pay. So we basically would talk about this whole thing of, you know, Uber's trying to be everywhere and for everyone, but right now it's for some people in some places. Mm. And so I started working quite a lot with the uh, payments team, the money team. And one of the big bets was we should launch cash. And it was a huge push around the business, but that's basically where it started from. So, you know, working on that, getting into how do you get that product to market, what does that mean in terms of you know how people understand how it impacts their experience? Um, got me kind of excited and hungry to be closer to the building again. Um, and then yeah, one of the things you know I always talk about is have a rich network. I reached out to someone who reached out to someone who um, uh, knew the head of pro the head of product for all of payments, and he said, "Yeah, we're trying to build out a team in Amsterdam. We're looking for a head of product." Um, you know, do you want to, and I put up my hand, do you want to join? I was like, absolutely. Went through the interviews and the rest was history. So product journey at Uber and then went off to Netflix. And um, actually two days ago, that was my first month at Google. Um, Amazing. Joined Google. Congratulations. Uh, I love anniversaries. My one year anniversary at product school is coming up next month. So Ooh, super, super exciting. Thank you. Um, you mentioned some of the other roles that you've had in the past, which is awesome. Uh, having all of that background when you're bringing that to a product role. I'm curious, what does it look like in your day to day? What sort of teams are you interacting with cross functionally? Yeah. So first of all, one of the things I want to, you know, um, kind of uh, talk about is I personally always say that as you kind of go through your career, you know, um, uh, as a product manager, especially, what starts to happen actually is more, it, it correlates with your exposure to risk. That's actually what it, you know, that's what's happening. So the more you are going sort of up the, the product management ladder, 
the more risk you're kind of responsible for, the more you have to be able to preempt those risks or understand them. Um, so that's kind of how I, how I think about it. So the numbers you're impacting, the DAUs, the scope, that's what's happening. It's sort of going exponentially. And it obviously just, you know, also um, uh, differentiating between an IC director of product and a people manager director of product. I'm a people manager, right? But there are also directors of products who are IC. So in my day to day, my most important goal in, you know, in, 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 in ultimately is that customers are happy and the team is happy, right? So we talk about, you know, you hear this all the time, people, product, process. Um, I very much believe in that sort of uh, way of thinking about it. And I generally like to spend, um, uh, depends on the day. So, you know, my sort of Mondays and Tuesdays, that's when I kind of spend time with the team. I always say my job is to be a trampoline for your career. So everyone can jump, right? Some people can jump higher, some people can jump a little bit, whatever you can jump, you jump as much. Obviously, also the jump has risk, which goes back to <laughs> you know, something depending on how high you jump. But, you know, the, the point is, um, you know, people can jump. My job is to add a trampoline to that, right? So how do I magnify and amplify that jump for you? You already know how to jump. I'm not teaching you how to jump. I'm just trying to help you magnify and amplify that jump. So I spend a big chunk of my time Mondays, Tuesdays, really meeting the team, spending time with the team, having my team staff, meeting my counterparts um, in engineering, UX, et cetera. And then sort of Wednesday, Thursdays, I typically think more about this is when I'm thinking. This is when we do sort of design reviews, product reviews, this is when I spend time in PRDs or you know, presentations. It's also when you I recommend having the cross-functional inter-team meetings because you know, you are also part of an ecosystem, right? There are other product managers, other functions. Mm -hmm. um, and then Google has this, um, Netflix also had it. We have a no meeting Friday, Uber had it on Thursdays. And I really value that, that is my maker time. That's when I write, that's when I think, that's when I reflect, that's when I try to distill what I've sort of absorbed during the week. So no day is, you know, the same, right? Um, it yeah. depends on the day, but ultimately the goal is to kind of get, you know, help, help the team unlock the impact for that week. That's amazing. So as you probably know, at Product School, one of the things that we're helping organizations do is set up product teams for the first time in many cases, or for companies that are looking to transition to having a digital product, that's something we help them with. And I love what you were saying about bolstering people's careers and, and being the trampoline for them. Do you have any like tips or best practices that you would share with an organization who might be setting up their product team for the first time? Uh, depends on the stage of the organization. If they're setting up for the first time, I would imagine that it's a startup or sort of a scale up if, or, you know, a company that had a different way of working and now actually wants to take a more sort of forward, you know, kind of big tech approach to tech, that, that does happen as well. Um, I think a couple of things. One is um, you'll be surprised how much natural product talent you can find within the company. And I'm a big believer. I mean, I'm here because Uber had a program that would help you make that transition, right? And there are many other people on my team who've gone through that journey as well. Same thing happens at Google. So, um, you know, I think a huge part is that homegrown, find the people who are already obsessed with the product, the ones who are the voice of the customer, the ones who think about, you know, they're not comfortable with things just being as is, right? That's kind of what a PM is always doing, is always how can we be better? What is the next problem? How can I look around the corner? Um, so that's one big area I talk about. I think the other one as well is um, really make sure that depending on the stage of the product, you're clear on, you know, you're not hiring someone to come in and project manage you actually understand the value that a product manager is going to bring. So spend a bit of time understanding that role. I say that actually to a lot of product managers with product marketing, which you might probably recognize. I'm always sort of, you know, people, there are a hundred definitions of what product marketing is. And it's like, why don't you just ask the people? So I would actually spend time understanding the craft, meet other people in the industry, meet other companies at the stage. I spend a lot of time speaking to companies that want to hire that first product manager. Um, and then finally, the skill sets are going into the weeds. Depending on where the product is, you might need a different kind of a product manager at a different stage of their career, 
right? You might say, you know, we hire um, a product manager that is more IC, hands-on, can unblock the engineering team, help them kind of, you know, um, uh, 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 really bring that context to the problem. Um, or if we have multiple product managers, then now I'm thinking about hiring, you know, that manager of man of product managers, right? So that's also important. Understand the craft, right? Look within and understand sort of where your product is and what you need right now. Yeah. Totally. Totally. That's awesome. That's really meaningful advice. Uh, a bit of a different swing at things. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just looking at the questions on the side. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> these are, these are going to be coming in from LinkedIn. Um, but yes, the, I want to take a stab at the flip side of that. You know, what mm. kind of advice would you have for an aspiring PM who maybe doesn't have that set up in their organization to transition internally and is really looking externally and wants to build up skills and, and, and where do they go? And yeah, what kind of directional advice do you have for them? I mean, that's a, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of a chicken and an egg, right? So I want to learn the craft, but I need a role to learn the craft. And there's a bit of a loop. Um, I think, you know, a couple of things. One is um, if you're in a company, I, I do think even if you, you believe there isn't a, a, a natural path, there is a way to kind of almost get yourself through the door by raising your hand up, working with your existing manager and saying, hey, I want to go shadow or donate 30% of my time um, for six months to kind of build that product management experience. And if you have the right kind of manager, and ultimately, what are we there for? It's to bring the best out of people. Um, if you have the right kind of manager, they should understand that. And they probably will say, hey, I'm probably going to lose you anyway if I don't do this. So let me invest in you and keep you in the company, right? Um, so I, that's one, one thing I would say. You'd be surprised. A lot, a lot of the time in my career, I found roles that were almost created. Um, I've seen that. You know, I've done it. I've seen, so sometimes it's just the right person. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is actually do the work, right? Mm -hmm. Like actually put in the hours and do the work. It's, it's easy to say, hey, I want to be a product manager. You can do one of the courses, but also there are other things you can do there. Like, um, you know, spend time reading a lot of really good product management books so that you understand and many, because there isn't one path. Spend a lot of time sort of absorbing that knowledge. Um, I'd spend a lot of time also finding networks of product managers if you can, like com some companies have talks or their conferences, go meet other people because when you put yourself out there, you know, maybe somebody will, will, um, will also, uh, uh, you know, sort of pick that up, um, that you are naturally, you have a natural product drive. And then I think the other one, this is probably a bit of a, a bit of a stretch, but start a side project, right? Like, you know, start talking about product management, find problems you're excited about, whether it's you're just writing about it, you're not actually building it, but you actually write the equivalent of what would be a PRD, so to speak. Um, but those things kind of train your brain to look for the problems and how to think about it from a product sense. And I used to say to a lot of product managers, your entire life can be a PM. It's just, your entire life has lots of problems, right? So I'm con constantly saying, there's a fantastic book, The Design of Every Everyday Things. Read that book. Yes. Um, and as you read that book and you go through life, just think if I was a product manager of this product, how would I, what would I do differently? If I was a product manager of this tap, what would I have done? What's, what affordances are there? What signals are there? So you're always training your brain to kind of say, what's the problem? How would I have approached it? What would be the cost of executing? And that's actually helping your, the neural networks in your brain learn the craft, right? So those would be my three things, like really look within, you'd be surprised. Um, try to find that network, that community, um, and put yourself, you know, sort of put yourself out there. And then third, yes, then do the work. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing when I was first getting into product marketing that I was doing, I was putting myself through school. You know, I couldn't take on uh, unpaid internships, for an example. I, I, I just couldn't. I was paying my way. Um, but I wanted to develop this product marketing experience. So actually, before I ended up at product school, I was working at a restaurant full time. And on the side, I reached out to a candle company on Instagram that I was buying candles from and asked them if they wanted me to put together a marketing strategy for them. You go. And 
it was just a way exactly like you're saying to execute that that aspect of your brain and show something for it at the end like look yeah. i did something Here, exactly. here's the impact so many startups are out there if you could somehow you know you know i mean yes within reason of course like you have uh, bills to pay and all of that but yeah find that time and no one's going to turn down free free time especially if you're yeah. you know you have other skills that people sort of recommend so that's exactly what I'm talking about when I say put yourself out yeah. there yeah. yeah and I add that color because I think that sometimes people think well I don't even know where to start with my own project mm -hmm. and I think even if you can identify a small need to help somebody else with yeah. people are so thankful you know exactly exactly amazing Kind of in line with that, uh, a little bit divergent, though, I want to talk a little bit about inspiration for you mm. and where in your, it could be day to day, it could be kind of that North Star in your life. Where are you finding inspiration? Wow. Yeah. So <laughs> inspiration for me comes in many, many, many different ways. So I generally think one of the biggest things you can do as a product manager is to learn almost like training yourself how to think and pattern match, right? So I'm always trying to find things that draw a parallel for me. Um, it could be art. It could be some other problem space that has absolutely nothing to do with mine. Um, I spend a lot of time unpacking and reading about other products and other product, what other product managers are doing. I spend a lot of time doing that. And I really sort of care about, really care about the craft. So I spend a lot of time also um, following some of the, you know, like there are a lot of awesome, uh, the sort of product Twitter is amazing, right? There are a lot of people talking about uh, different aspects. So I, I spent a lot of time absorbing all of that. But I really think that um, what you, if you, ultimately what you're doing is problem solving. And so, you know, what you're doing is trying to figure out and, and you know, look into problems. So I, I'm very much into, for example, astrology. So I spend a lot of time reading about that and reading about you know, what new thing is coming uh, in the astrological space, space. I spend a lot of time thinking about sports because guess what? When I'm on a, I play tennis, when I'm on a tennis court, there is a strategy, right? There is a problem, there's a goal, there's an approach and there's a strategy. So all these kind of tangential things that are constantly training your brain um, really help. And then just also it's great to, I mean, ultimately, if you can find that inner calm, right? That inner sort of, um, uh, uh, energy and excitement, wherever it comes from, you can channel that into the work, right? So yes. you feed your soul and then you channel that into the work. So I'm, you know, I play the piano, I'm very, I, I love my tennis and I spend time trying to be better at those things. And they actually help me be better at, you know, the sort of nine to five, although it's never really nine to five, of course, but yeah, <laughs> nine to five. <laughs> funny joke as we are both coming to you live at 10 20 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. yeah just a little just a little overtime um that's awesome and I you know I recently had the opportunity to take a vacation and I don't know how this looks in your life but in that one week of pure vacation where I just shut off slack you know like, like shut off email yeah. I felt like I came back rejuvenated. I hit the ground running. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's crazy. Like you're saying, when you have that time to breathe and that space, I think it does more for you than just always being on the grind. Exactly. And if there's one feedback I'll give to most product managers is, do you have enough time in your week to think? And are you carving out time to refresh? Because it's mm -hmm. just go, 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 go. And you are not going to see the patterns and you're not going to see the problems and connect the dots if you don't take a step back. You can't take a step back when you're stressed and you're, you know, um, the best thing I can probably tell you to do is like have eight hours of sleep. It's probably yes. the best thing ever because your brain will be just on a different plane. So absolutely everything you just said. I delete all my apps when I go on holiday. I just delete them. I delete the Gmail. I delete calendar. I delete everything. So I can't even like I'm just I'm off. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, it's so important. It's so important. And we know, right, we know all the studies coming out about health and, and the long term uh, importance of taking care of ourselves. Absolutely. So 
on that, um, you've had an amazing product journey and it sounds like your, your background has been super, super diverse. You've worked across different continents, across companies. Can you tell us a little bit about the role of diversity for you personally and kind of what that looks like in your, in your role? Absolutely. I mean, my entire existence is kind of, you know, di- diverse, right? And like you just said, um, you know, as a black woman, as a woman, um, as, you know, a Nigerian girl, you know, now supporting a team at uh, this, you know, big tech company that is a household name. Um, I, I do think one big part is if you can see it, you can be it. I always say that. So part of what I kind of really push for is it's very important that we show and celebrate those examples because it gives somebody who's sitting there, you know, thinking about a career or whatever. Oh, it's possible. I can actually, you know, I see it. So, oh, okay, it's possible. There's, a, there's something that kind of unblocks. I think the other part as well is, um, I used to have a colleague that always said the magic happens in the confluence of our differences. And I love that. Yeah, exactly. It's just so profound. I mean, we talked about that from the diversity of the different roles, like, at the you know, design, engineering, and actually the magic happens in that intersection. But it's the same with, you know, the diversity of our backgrounds, right? We all bring a different facet. When I was doing with my team, when we were doing a lot of work in Brazil, it was interesting how people on my team who were Indian, me being Nigerian, we could relate to some of the paradigms in Brazil. We're like, oh yeah, we get that. Oh yeah, you know, the things, and you could bring that to the product. And I think the other one as well is that if you're going to build for the world, you kind of have to represent the world. So diversity, obviously it's, there, there's so many facets of diversity, um, but I'm, for me, the growth for me now is actually going even further and trying to really be conscious of what I don't know, right? Because there's, you know, there's so many facets of diversity, the obvious sort of pillars, but then there's so many other things. Like, am I being inclusive for people who have kids? Am I inclusive for people with, you know, who for, you know, as it comes to accessibility in the product? You know, I remember once we had a Figma file and it was blue, true story, blue and purple for some mock-ups. And guess what? Someone on my team was colorblind. Never had that problem before. Um, so blue and purple, if you're not, you know, that actually is the same for somebody who is colorblind. Yes. And so we had to make it blue and orange. And since then, I'm so aware of, you know, what we're even doing within the company. So, you know, all of this to say, the more we can have multiple facets, the more we can see new perspectives around problems, mm-hmm. the more we can bring that magic out in the confluence of the differences. So I'm, you know, I'm a big believer. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, and the um, numbers don't lie, by the way, right? Like, yeah. The stats show the products actually are better. So, how do you take diversity and turn it from something that, you know, maybe companies or individuals are speaking about and really making it concrete and actionable? So, the one big thing, and this is it's sort of, um, I say this about careers too, by the way. I always say if you if you were to ask a PM to go build a product, no PM would ever say, my goal is my sort of key result is to launch it next year. That would never be a goal. It would there would be clear things, you know, we want to increase this, we want to move that, we want to make sure we do at least two of these or three of that, or whatever. There'd be concrete steps towards it. I say that about a career, PM your career, right? So oh, there's want to get promoted next year. And I say that about diversity. Um, you can't solve a problem that you don't aren't able to articulate. Mm-hmm. You can't even come up with somebody ask a question about strategy. Strategy is ultimately a very clear diagnosis of problems and deciding to focus on a subset of them with some guiding principles. That's really what it is. So you're you can't solve a problem and come up with a strategic approach to anything if you don't actually understand the problem. So tactically, how do you educate yourself in solving the problem? And for for me, what I do is I'm always talking about it. Might for some people it's uncomfortable, get comfortable with that discomfort. That's when we're growing. That's you know what I say. Um, the allies are their people who want to be allies within companies. They sort of lean into also talking about it. My um, uh, ex engineering partner at Uber just even had this post about it, right? And how you know he you know he he called out how it changed how we interviewed, right? Making sure that there were people in the panel, right? Making sure there were people reflective of different. Uh, you know, women and different backgrounds on a panel, because then you can, you can actually see how that candidate interacts and whether, you know, they're ready to uh, have an inclusive perspective. So 
I think, you know, um, there's a lot, there's the sort of equal and there's equity, we'll talk about this, but the, ed the sort of educating yourself about the problem, edu educating yourself about how so we have so many um, uh, misrepresented, I don't want to call them memes, but they're like memes, like it slows down the pipeline or it's, you know, you will have to drop your standards. There are so many studies that show that, 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 that th those don't hold through and actually you end up with a much better product ultimately and therefore the numbers for the business move. So tactically, constantly talking about it, right? Setting some very clear goals, whether it's we'll make sure, Rooney rule, we'll make sure that before we close on a candidate, we must have a woman or, you know, someone of color, someone who is um, not straight, right? Someone who, like, whatever, you, you know, come up with things like that. And then reporting, how are we actually doing? I always say, if you wanted to create a dinner party, you wanted a diverse set of people, but you every you put a paper bag over your head. You have no idea who sat at the table. How on earth are you going to know who's sitting at the table? You kind of have yeah. to talk about it. So this is this is uh, this is my thing. Yeah, talk about the problems and set a plan. Amazing. I mean, if those aren't great words to to wrap us up on, I don't know what else is. Problem is the very epicenter of product, right? <laughs> exactly, right? <laughs> That's awesome. AB, I want to be respectful of your time this evening. I know we are approaching probably bedtime, at least for me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, thank you so, so much for, for tuning in this evening and sharing all of these amazing insights with our audience, with me. I know that I've certainly learned a lot from you. Thank you so much for having me. And I, I, I can see the chat is blowing up. Thank you so much for all sort of tuning in as well. Fantastic. Next time we'll get you uh, in your time zone to, to help everybody. I'm out. looking forward to that. that we can be inclusive about the time zones too. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, Avi, you have a wonderful rest of your evening. You uh, and thank you to everybody who tuned in this evening. Take care.